I'm not checking it. Clear. I think that's a good game plan. It works for me.
card, I keep these stupid stickers just in case I need to mark something. So my manager's name is Cat Turner. That's her email. That's C A T. Concerns up to her. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll yeah. just have them reach out and see what happens, right? Yeah. Uh, What's the worst thing I can say? Starts, yeah. yeah. You know? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Be safe out there. You know, I just, uh, I'm hoping for a quiet night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hoping.
that happy though. Oh my god. You have no idea.
time? Yep. Just for a few minutes? Michael, hello. It's been a busy day as one of the election officials here. The voter turnout has been very good. Eighty percent. I believe that is better. That does happen. That's better than the mailing ballots coming in. Cut off.
you'll be so you'll spend that. Are you ready? 
I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if you don't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. Negative attention getting.
Welcome to Yahoo's 2020 election night special. You're looking at a live picture of the White House. I'm Jen Rogers. While this may all feel familiar, maps with poll closing times, electoral college votes being tallied, this election night, like so much in 2020, is unprecedented. As we begin, let's just reset our expectations a little bit for what tonight looks like. Patience is going to be key. There's a good chance we will not know tonight if President Trump wins a second term or vice president. Joe Biden will be the 46th president of the United States. Here's what we do know, though. With a global pandemic raging, we have seen historic early voter turnout with 100 million people casting ballots before polling places even open today. We could surpass 150 million votes for the first time in U.S. history. Polls have started to close, including a number in key battleground states. Uh, 7 p.m. at 7 p.m., Indiana, Kentucky, South Carolina, Vermont, Virginia, parts of Florida. Uh, Georgia was also set to close, but a few districts extending the deadline after some earlier issues. 7.30 p.m., we just passed that. North Carolina had been scheduled, uh, but voting has been extended at four polling sites, delaying results, Ohio and West Virginia. And then 17 states at 8 p.m., including the rest of Florida and the key state of Pennsylvania. Let's look at the Yahoo Election Center for early results right now. And again, this is early. This is a long night. What we can tell you is that President Trump has been declared the winner in Kentucky, while former Vice President Joe Biden has taken Vermont. Uh, these are small in the stakes of the Electoral College. Uh, Kentucky's eight and Vermont is three. And of course, this is a contest to get to 270. So we also can call uh, that President Trump has taken West Virginia as well. Uh, going through the election center right now, of course, uh, we are have a lot of eyes on Florida. A uh, 58% of estimated votes in there. It is very tight right now. Uh, Florida counts fast, actually. Don't be surprised if there's a Biden lead. We are seeing that right now, just above 50%. Uh, more Republican uh, counties in the panhandle. Those close at 8 p.m. Uh, Georgia, again, we already told you about some of the slowdown there. I can be a little bit slower to count, so we'll see how we do on that front. I want to bring in a panel here. I am joined by Yahoo Finance's editor-in-chief, Andy Serwer, uh, Yahoo senior political correspondent, John Ward, and HuffPost politics reporter, Tara Golshin. So, Andy, I want to start with you right now and get, talk about some of the data that we're starting to get from the Associated Press and the AP VoteCast, where uh, they have data on voters. And overwhelmingly, uh, the majority of the voters said the pandemic had affected them personally. About four in 10 said their household had lost a job or income. They also had uh, data saying that uh, people, two thirds of voters saying that their choice for president was driven by their opinion of President Trump. What does that tell us at this moment? Well, Jen, President Trump, of course, is the main event here. I don't think that's a surprise. And, you know, all the drama and the momentousness leading up to this one night, we're finally here. Uh, and of course, the topic is all about Donald Trump. It's really a referendum about Donald Trump and his leadership in terms of his personal style, his policies, and how he's led this country through the pandemic. So far, though, we're not seeing any surprises. It's very, very early. Those three states that have been called were all predicted to go Vermont to Biden and West Virginia, Kentucky to Trump. Um, you're seeing some returns, as you said, coming out of these other states. Uh, Florida does have 50 percent counted, but we're not going to probably know that for quite some time. And I'd be very wary if you see these states leaning one way or the other to draw any conclusions in some instances. And I think those uh, six swing states are going to be absolutely essential, which is Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan and Arizona. That to me is the whole ball of wax because I don't think there's going to be a lot of surprises when it comes to places, of course, like, you know, Kansas or California, New York. So we'll be watching. And, and of course, the counting is so important in all those states and they count differently. And so that's going to keep us up probably very late at night and maybe tomorrow and some days after that as well. 
Uh, let's go to John Ward on that, because, John, we've heard about this possible blue mirage in Sunbelt states that report mail-in and early votes first, and then a red mirage in Great Lakes states that report in-person votes first. As Andy said, I mean, it's this sort of patchwork. And also, we've never been through this with this, this absentee tsunami in terms of uh, how many but ballots were cast early. So what should we be looking at here? Um, is it the margins that are important? Is it how many votes are outstanding at this point? What are you watching? Well, yes, we are going to be looking at the margins in some of these states that are going to be reporting uh, early tonight. Um, but I have to say, uh, any hopes for Joe Biden to have a huge early lead in the early returns in Florida uh, has not materialized. There are a few good signs for Biden in Florida, but by far the headline out of the first 35 minutes here of uh, returns coming out of Florida is the shocking results out of Miami-Dade County. I want to throw a few numbers uh, your way. Four years ago, Trump won Florida by 117,000 votes out of 9 million votes cast altogether. In Miami-Dade County, Hillary Clinton beat Trump there 624,000 to 333,000. Donald Trump, with 84% of the vote in, in Miami-Dade, has 457,000 votes in Miami-Dade County. That's 120,000 more. That's his margin of victory from four years ago. That's just from Miami-Dade. Now, if it doesn't mean necessarily that uh, Trump is going to win Florida, but Joe Biden's path to victory in Florida just got a lot harder. And if Donald Trump wins Florida, um, and the presidency, what happened to Democrats with Cuban-American voters in Miami-Dade County is going to be a massive, massive story. Uh, Tara Gulshan, uh, going to you on some of the, the demographics and what we're looking at here, because as you hear John talking about uh, the, the votes that President Trump has consolidated in Miami-Dade, uh, look, uh, the, the Republicans are saying that the Democrats got all their votes early on in uh, the, the cat ballots that were cast uh, the last you know few days and few weeks in some cases. Uh, they needed to get out uh, a lot of different bases here. Do we know anything in terms of the Democrats? Graphics, the suburban women that we've heard of, the people of color, uh, how people were able to get out that vote. Do we have any insight onto that yet? I think I'm just going to caution that it is still really early. And as much as I would like to uh, know the, and have some tea leaves to look into, um, the exit polls at this point I'm taking with a, a grain of salt. Um, but that said, there are things that we've seen through investments from the campaigns um, that can give us some indications as to what's happening on the ground. Uh, Biden has had some difficulty with Latino voters, specifically in Florida, um, with something the campaign has privately admitted to. Uh, we have seen that he's polling behind uh, Hillary Clinton among uh, Latino voters. And uh, when it comes to Latino men, for example, they're neck and neck, um, Biden and Trump. So those are the things that we're kind of keeping an eye on, and I expect that we'll see that turnout in, in Florida. When it comes to young voters, however, we've seen an incredible uh, outpouring of support and Biden's investments and outside groups like Tom Steyer, the billionaire from California who ran for president briefly and has this massive operation uh, to turn out young voters, they invested $40 million and it has paid off. We saw that uh, the poll numbers for Biden among young voters really flipped um, from May when they weren't really that interested in, in him um, till now where uh, there's a majority of young voters are interested and we're seeing the turnout numbers from uh, early voting and absentee in states like North Carolina where there's been a huge uh, increase in young young voters turning out. So, uh, John, you've been focused on election integrity, and uh, we've had the president raising uh, what, you know, unfounded claims about voter fraud. There have been worries about intimidation at the polls, last-minute court challenges. Were there areas of concern today that people need to know about, and what are you watching on this front tonight? Uh, this is actually one of the, the good news stories um, from this entire election cycle. There were a lot of concerns because of the president's rhetoric um, that some of his supporters would uh, basically go to try to prevent the cheating that he was claiming was going on in places like Philadelphia. He, of course, made these allegations with no evidence. Uh, and, you know, I've reported, along with many other reporters, 
um, on extensively on, uh, you know, what happens in terms of cheating and fraud and elections. Um, you know, in short, basically, it hap- cheating happens um, at a small scale level. That's, you know, a reality of, of politics. But um, expert after expert, Republican, Democrat, uh, and nonpartisan are adamant that, you know, there's no way to rig a statewide election, much, much less a national election. So the concern was not necessarily that there would be poll watchers, because those are part of the process, but that people who were not poll watchers, who had not gone through accreditation, who had not signed up with the party and been, you know, basically approved to be inside the polling place, would go and stand outside polling places and, and act in an intimidating way. And I think probably even some of the caravans that we saw uh, from Trump supporters uh, in places like New York over the weekend, heighten some of those concerns. The good news is there were random, uh, you know, isolated uh, reports of a few things here and there. But but really, we had a pretty stress-free day. I think a lot of that probably was the fact that there was so much early voting and voting by mail. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm really grateful and, and happy that we didn't have uh, anything of consequence happen at the polls. Uh, So right now, uh, going back to the election center, we do have another state that has been called uh, for uh, Joe Biden, Virginia. So now we have uh, Biden with Vermont and Virginia and President Trump uh, with Kentucky and West Virginia. Uh, Right now going pretty much according to plan, Andy Serra, as you had pointed out earlier. Andy, look, it is not just about who wins the presidency. There are a lot of major races down ballot, including the balance of power in the Senate. I mean, Democrats are seeking to pick up enough seats to take control of the Senate for the first time since 2015. We've got 35 seats up for grabs tonight. Uh, Which states here do we need to be looking at? And uh, also to give us, you know, an early look at who will ultimately have the majority. Yeah, I mean, this is you're right. It's the other big battle. Uh, President Trump has said the House is in play and most people aren't buying that. But the Senate very much so. And, you know, the Democrats, frankly, do have um, some advantages here. They really only have one very vulnerable seat. And that's uh, Doug Jones in Alabama running against uh, Tommy Tuberville, the former Auburn football coach. But if you look at Maine, Susan Collins, of course, that's a very high profile race. Uh, She's in for the fight of her life against Sarah Gideon, a place like uh, uh, Colorado with John Hickenlooper, he could pick up a seat, um, as well as in Arizona, look good, looks good for the Democrats as well, um, with Mr. Kelly over there. So um, there's definitely some bright spots potentially, but you know it's going to get tough. I mean, people a number of uh, weeks ago said if Susan Collins is done in Maine, now that's tightened up and it may not be the case, although there's rank choice va- voting there. So that's that's another whole thing to get into in that state. Um, but it also depends on how things sort of pan out, you know? I mean, in other words, you got Georgia, a lot of people said, oh, that's going to flip blue, but you have two Senate races there that are probably going to be too close to call. There may be a runoff in January. You know, if there's a blue wave, not only does the president win Georgia and they pick up two Senate seats, I think that's probably going to be pretty unlikely. But, you know, all this stuff is still outstanding. Right now, we really don't know anything yet because, as we've both been saying, Jen, things have sort of played out according to plan and consensus and nothing unusual or indicative, indeed, has happened yet. And uh, we just have to note again the absolute uh, historic voter turnout that we've had with 100 million ballots cast before polls even open today. Tara, Andy brought up the Alabama race with Doug Jones' uh, Senate seat, which uh, has been you know, expected to possibly be a loss for Democrats. You've also been writing about uh, the Michigan Senate race and the GOP pouring money in there, the possible another pickoff for Democrats. Is that still one to be watching tonight? I think it's one that Republicans definitely want us to be watching. I, I, When it comes to the two seats that Republicans had a chance at this cycle, obviously Doug Jones in Alabama uh, is a much easier win for Republicans. I wouldn't uh, feel comfortable calling Michigan's the Senate race a toss up at the moment. I think Trump would have to be doing a little bit better in the polls for that to be the case. Uh, he and his campaign have really seen his uh, decline in Michigan, and we saw a, a real rebuke of Republican reader, leadership in the state over the past four years. Um, so those are kind of positive signs for Democrats. But the Michigan case is interesting. You have this incumbent Democratic senator who was a relative unknown to uh, 
just about 36% of the electorate going into this election cycle. And you have this really strong, uh, what Republicans see as a high a strong candidate and a strong recruit in John James, who is a veteran, young, black entrepreneur in Michigan, and who has been poor, Republicans have just been pouring so much money into this race. And even in the final weekend, um, the super PAC aligned with Mitch McConnell poured millions more into this race. They really see it as their only opportunity to kind of stave off uh, a Democratic takeover. Uh, let's get some uh, final thoughts from John. John, you had pointed to the Miami-Dade results that were coming in. We know Florida is critical. What other states uh, right now, where will you start to uh, move to? What other numbers are you looking at right now that are key? Sure. I mean, I think you now that we know Florida is going to be close, um, I, I think that's pretty clear. And actually, you know, it looks like Trump actually is likely to win in Florida. Um, I think that uh, people are going to be looking at four states, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Ohio, and Arizona. Arizona will come in a little later. Um, if Trump wins all of those, uh, then it goes to um, you know Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. If Biden wins three of those four, any three of those four, uh, I think he can get away with winning just Wisconsin and Michigan. So those are the states in play. I would disagree with Andy a little bit here. I think we've seen a seismic development with the numbers from Miami-Dade. Uh, Biden supporters are not going to be uh, happy to hear this, but it's a, it's a pretty big blow to Biden. Uh, and I think it changes the trajectory of the night potentially. Yeah, I agree with uh, John. I, I, I maybe shouldn't have, I should have made that point that actually uh, that is an indication that uh, there's, there's trouble. There's and also, I agree with what he's saying, that there's there's a places that he can make this up, but not a good scenario uh, in Florida. And, you know, if he doesn't pick up some of these states, you guys, then we're just back to where we were in 2016. Uh it is a long night ahead of us. Again, uh, we are getting glimpses and we will continue to follow all of the data here. Uh, you can also follow along on uh, the Yahoo Election Center as well. The same map that we have up there. Uh, you can take a look at that on your own. And we will be back with more election coverage at 9.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Andy Serwer. John Ward and Tara Golshin. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Again, we're back at 9.30 p.m. with more coverage here on Yahoo.
Sorry, man. I got producer in my ear. What's uh, what's up?
Why am I here?
to dial that number to the Zoom ID, hit down, hit the password, hit them. Just we're not going to be live, we're just going out as live. Okay, then we're not live. So we're not going to be live. Yeah, I think we'll record it on Channel 6.
ready?
and raise families in our smaller cities and towns and teach our kids our values are going to keep their voice, keep their influence, and help our nation come back even stronger. The trust of the people of Kentucky has literally changed my life. When I witnessed Dr. Martin Luther King's March on Washington speech as an intern back in 1963, I dreamed about doing big things to help my state and our country. I never imagined Kentuckians would make me the longest serving senator in our state's history, or that my fellow Senate Republicans would make me the longest serving Republican leader in U.S. Senate history. Together, we've used Kentucky's front row seat for the good of our state and of our nation. We've made historic progress in rebuilding a federal judiciary that respects separation of powers. We've confirmed brilliant and qualified men and women who revere our Constitution. We've delivered historic relief and major legislative victories for Kentucky and for all 50 states. We've rebuilt our national defense and deterred our enemies. And in a turbulent time, we have accomplished all this while protecting the Senate's own rules and core tradition. The Senate kept the heat of intense partisanship from damaging our institution forever. The framers firewall held a lot. So tonight, Kentucky said, we're not finished yet. Kentucky wants more of the policies that built the best economy in modern history, not socialism that would stifle prosperity and hurt work. We want to continue rebuilding our military and leading around the world. Not to cut bad deals or just hope our adversaries will ignore us. We want to keep treating China like the threat it is not settle for a future where America slides into second class. We're going to keep standing up for the unborn, not surrender to an elite coastal culture that says the most vulnerable lives are disposable. So tonight, Kentucky said we're keeping our front row seat in the Senate. We don't yet know which presidential candidate will begin a new term in January. We don't know which party will control the Senate. But some things are certain. Already. We know great challenges will remain before us, challenges that could not care less about our political polarization. We know our next president will need to unite the country, even as we all continue to bring different ideas and commitments to the table. But we also know, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that our nation, our people, can do this. For 231 years, Americans have dominated one challenge after another. We have everything we need to defeat this terrible virus and come back stronger. We have the most resilient institution, the most blessed land, and the greatest people in the history of the world. This is no time to attack our Constitution like some outdated relic. These are the times it was made for. This is no time to tear down statues of our founders and heroes. This is the time to follow their example. This is no time to declare war on our institutions because one side is angry that the framers made it hard to achieve radical change. This is a time to defend all that we have inherited and pass it on even stronger. When I was a child, our nation was battling a different virus Polio. It was hurting thousands and thousands and was battling a different virus, polio. It was hurting thousands and thousands of families every year. As a very young child, that fight became my own. While my father was off fighting World War II in Europe, I was fighting a different battle. Thank God I had a guardian angel. Her name was Dean. And she also happened to be my mother. My mom found our way to Warm Springs in Georgia. We trekked to the facility over and over, more than 100 miles round trip. My mother took the doctor's advice as gospel. She kept me still when a toddler just wanted to run around, of course. She guided me through exercises I apparently totally hated. And she did it all while checking the mailbox every day 
for precious leaders, letters from my dad uh, from overseas. It is only because of her determination that my first vivid memory by her side in a small store on our way out of Warm Springs for the last time, buying my first real pair of shoes. About 10 years later, American Ingenuity had found the vaccine and American Free Enterprise was scaling it up. We beat polio here and we have almost defeated it worldwide. So my fellow Americans, our country is gonna get back on our feet. Our nation has real challenges and real adversaries. But our fellow citizens are not our enemies. There's no challenge that we cannot overcome together. My fellow Kentuckians, you've given me the honor of a lifetime. I'll always be grateful. I will never let you down. May God bless Kentucky and the United States of America.
We should read this because it gives you a lot of the ideological roots of what we're experiencing right now. Uh, we'll have a chance some other time to, to really sit down and talk about it. I've read uh, the book at this point. So, uh, but I'd like you to talk to people about how you see the stakes of this election and, and, and what you think, you know, really sort of what's happening now. Put it that way. What are we, what are we facing? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that this isn't Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. This election is a referendum on fascism. <laughs>
But one minute. Less than one minute. And made it. Uh, hang on right there, we'll get to you in a bit. 
Evening. Welcome to the Yahoo election coverage. I'm Kristen Myers. You guys are seeing some crowds outside of the White House right now. Well, it is 9.30 p.m. here on the East Coast, and many states have seen their polls close, including here in New York. Earlier, we had closures in South Carolina, Virginia, and Ohio. Now, we did have some delays today in Georgia and also in North Carolina, where polls were supposed to close by 7.30 p.m. In North Carolina, several precincts state open past that 7.30 p.m. closure to make up for some of those delays. Now here at 9.30, we have poll closures in states like Texas and Massachusetts, as well as key states, including Pennsylvania, Florida, and Michigan. Now just keeping an eye to the future for the rest of the night, we are still waiting on election results for Nevada, California, and Utah, among many others. 
Now let's see where we are on the map right now. Looking over at the Yahoo Election Center, we do have some calls in some states right now. Let's start with the incumbent, President Donald Trump. He has taken right now both Dakotas, Wyoming, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina, just to name a few. Now looking over at his challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden. He has taken New York, Illinois, New Mexico, Virginia, Maryland, and Connecticut, again, just to name a few there. Now, we do also have a Senate race right now, of course, in Congress. While Democrats are largely expected to keep control of the House, there are several Senate seats up for grabs. Right now, Democrats actually have 42 seats to Republicans, 38 seats. Remember that 51 seats are needed for a majority. Now, looking over at some states right now, some key states uh, in this election right now, looking over first at Michigan. This is not a state that has yet been called. Uh, we have right now Donald Trump, 57.5% to Joe Biden's 40.7%. Looking over now at Florida, Again, this is not another state that has not yet been called. 51.3% for President Trump, whereas Joe Biden has 47.8% of the votes right now. Over in North Carolina, Joe Biden ahead here, 50.2% to Donald Trump's 48.6%. And lastly, let's look over at Iowa right now. That winner getting six electoral votes. We do not yet have results as of that, as for that race as yet. All right. Remember, it is a race right now to 270 electoral college votes. Again, Joe Biden right now with 122 of those votes to Donald Trump's 92. I want to bring in our panel now. I'm joined now by Yahoo News White House correspondent Hunter Walker, Yahoo Finance's senior columnist Rick Newman, and Yahoo News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. We'll be chatting with her a little bit later about the election and its impact on the coronavirus pandemic. So we have a lot to get to tonight. Hunter, I wanna start with you, starting with the presidential race right now. I know Florida is a state that you have been watching closely. Uh, it, what's been surprising to some folks out there is how well Donald Trump has actually been doing in Miami-Dade County, which typically leans Democratic. Wondering if you can share some thoughts on that race there. One of the big stories uh, in Florida has been Joe Biden's underperformance with Latino voters. Uh, progressive allies of Biden were raising alarms about this uh, over the summer. The Biden campaign did do a little bit more Latino outreach, but um, you know he has really struggled on that front. And and this has been true, you know, beyond Florida, which is obviously such a key state. Uh, you're seeing Joe Biden improve upon Hillary Clinton's standing with white voters. Uh, you're seeing him improve upon her standing uh, in the Midwest, but the Latino vote has really been a struggle for him. And Florida is a place where it could prove decisive. I mean, there's no call there yet. And I think looking at the map as we have it right now, you know, there's not there's no key state <laughs> that's been decided yet, right? Every result we see there right now is predictable. But there are some early indications in Florida, particularly as you were pointing out, Miami-Dade, that you know are troubling for Biden. That being said, you know Biden seems to have a lot more potential paths to victory tonight. There are a lot of plausible ways he could win without Florida. Uh, for Trump, that state is simply vital. Uh, Florida and Pennsylvania are ones. Uh, where, you know, basically he needs to pull off a straight flush of the toss-up states. And those are two of the more key ones uh, to his potential path. Now, Rick, I want to bring you in here because Hunter just brought up something that I want to talk to you about. So no president has actually won the White House without Florida in the last several elections. Uh, Republican pollster and strategist Frank Luntz the other day just said that Biden only needs to win one of three states, Florida being one, North Carolina and Ohio being the other since they are election bellwethers. I'm wondering what you make of that. Is Does Biden's path to victory require the state of Florida, which again, right now, he is trailing uh, behind Donald Trump? The first thing that came to my mind when it started to seem that uh, Florida was beyond Joe Biden's reach is, well, there goes an early bedtime. Because for anybody who wanted a quick outcome, the really only way to get to a quick outcome was Biden wins Florida, because if he wins Florida, 
Uh, that would tell you that um, Trump is just not going to reach the thresholds he needs in the other swing states. But look, I mean, looks like we're going to have a close race here. So you mentioned the other swing states. Um, so the, the next best um, outlook for uh, an early bedtime, but not as early as before, is watch North Carolina and Ohio. Um, Biden is ahead in those states and the votes we've counted so far. But I think we all learned a lesson last time around and in prior elections. Don't assume that that early vote count means anything because rural counties that favor uh, Donald Trump tend to come in later. Um, so North Carolina looks like it's going to be really close. And um, for those for those of us who are fascinated by the uh, election needles and things like that, we've sort of got a war of the needles going on because, as I'm noticing on Twitter and elsewhere, uh, people are commenting that uh, the New York Times seems to be uh, saying uh, Donald Trump is likely to win North Carolina, but Fox News seems to think um, Joe Biden's going to win North Carolina. So uh, let's just Let's just assume we don't know who's going to win North Carolina yet or Ohio. If there's any good um, news for uh, Biden supporters here, it's that uh, he does seem to be outperforming relative to Hillary Clinton in 2016 in a lot of places that matter. Now, again, we don't know final votes, so that's just reading tea leaves. But um, that means Biden is probably going to be competitive in places she wasn't, which means it's going to be close. It's not going to be a Biden blowout. It's going to be close or a... Uh, modest Biden victory at best. Rick, I do want to ask you about another state here when it comes to the presidential race, which would be Pennsylvania. Uh, Joe Biden did have a much larger lead than he has right now, 57.4 percent to Donald Trump's 41.6 percent. Just under 15 percent of the votes have been counted right now. How critical is the state of Pennsylvania for Joe Biden um, and for victory? Uh, well, his campaign manager, I think, just a few minutes back said it is absolutely crucial we win Pennsylvania. And the Biden campaign has been pretty uh, forthright uh, in the past, saying recently, we want to win Florida, but we can win without Florida. So if you hear them say they need Pennsylvania, uh, they probably feel they do. That's that's not purely math. It's just that in order to motivate the kind of people to vote for Biden that you probably do need in Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, you need the same types of people in uh, Pennsylvania. And that is at least some portion of the white working class voters who went for Trump last time around. So clearly Biden is trying to trying to pick off some of those voters. Um, he doesn't need a lot of them uh, because we all know how close Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin were last time around. Uh, we just don't know how many he's going to get. And Pennsylvania, by the way, is one of the slowest counting states. I don't think anybody expects to have a decisive outcome from Pennsylvania tonight. So if it turns on Pennsylvania, you know, maybe by Thursday or Friday, we'll know the outcome there. I do want to mention for everyone that Colorado did turn on the map, Biden taking that state. I want to switch now to some of the Senate races, uh, some key Senate races. And Hunter, I want to start with you here with the state of Georgia. Of course, as I mentioned at the top, essentially right now, this is not just a race for the pres for the White House, for the, the presidential race. It is also a race for seats inside the Senate with Democrats hoping to pick up several state uh, several seats excuse me, over in the state of Georgia, right? We have a special election right now, and it was almost a three-way tie, a three-legged race between Kelly Leffler, Raphael Warnock, and Doug Collins. And then, of course, we have the incumbent Senator David Perdue being faced off with a Democratic challenger, John Ossoff. How important would it be, not just for Democrats in the Senate, but also in that state and, and, and for politics in that state, if Georgia did flip blue, if we did see Raphael Warnock manage to take that seat, and if we saw John Ossoff manage to unseat Senator Perdue for his seat? Well, there are a couple Hunter? of these Senate races. Yep. Uh, there, there are a couple no, no, of these ahead. Senate races that I'm talking. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Um, there there. OK, uh, there are a couple of these Senate races that are really interesting to me. Um, Georgia is there. Uh, South Carolina also where you're seeing Lindsey Graham um, face off from Jamie against Jamie Harrison, the Democrat. And, you know, these are places in the South, which was at one point a Republican stronghold uh, where the Democrats do seem to be making gains on both levels. And I think this is extremely important for them, because as we saw in the Obama years, you know, the Democrats have not necessarily been able to get a ton done 
uh, as long as Mitch McConnell is leading the Senate. Uh, so these are these are super interesting. But I think this also goes back to what Rick was saying about the presidential race. Um, the Florida and Ohio are important in that they might get decided early, but they are not necessarily crucial to the path of Joe Biden. And the the fact that we're talking about Georgia and some of these southern places, North Carolina, as swing states, uh, really reflects a big change. And you know, when I talk to um, Biden campaign folks and, and allies of the Biden campaign, they refer to some of those other gains as icing. You know, uh, extra extra goodies that would be nice, but not necessarily part of the bread and butter he'd need. Uh, he's he's been doing well for a long time in the upper Midwest. Uh, his poll leads there are much more solid than Florida, where you saw things go back and forth. Uh, he's also been pretty solid in the Southwest. Arizona is a key state that I'm watching. And if he does well in the upper Midwest and he does well in the Southwest, uh, you know, these questions like Georgia, Texas, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania are really going to become moot. Now, Rick, Hunter actually mentioned a Senate race that I want to chat with you about, which is South Carolina. Jamie Harrison actually did have a slight lead over the incumbent Senator Lindsey Graham there right now, according to the Yahoo Election Center. Lindsey Graham right now has 54.3% of the votes to 44.3% for Jamie Harrison right now. About 30% of the votes have been counted, but would love some of your quick thoughts on, on Jamie Harrison, if he is able to unseat Lindsey Graham tonight, how important that would be going forward? I mean, it would be a big embarrassment for somebody who's become a prominent Republican and Trump supporter. Obviously, he, we know Jamie or uh, Lindsey Graham, he flipped. He said Donald Trump was unfit for office and some worse things in 2016. And now he's one of uh, Trump's golfing buddies and biggest supporters in the Senate. So that would be an embarrassment for Trump and obviously for Lindsey Graham. Um, let's keep in mind only 30 percent of the vote in that those early results are almost meaningless. And Lindsey Graham can survive. And there are still uh, many other ways Democrats could take even a slim majority uh, in the Senate. I mean, the Senate races that I'm looking at that are that are possibly uh, flips from uh, Republican to Democrat. Those two in Georgia we mentioned, there's one in North Carolina, uh, one in Maine, one in Arizona, one in Colorado, possibly uh, a seat in Iowa, Kansas, Texas, and Montana. So Republicans are defending a lot of real estate. The one thing that might be in their favor at this point, uh, you know, some of these polls that, for example, showed Biden with a shot to win Georgia, that, that was startling. Uh, because Georgia has been solidly red for a long time. And based on what looked like to be the results there at the presidential level, um, those polls look like maybe they were wrong. And the polls even showed Biden with a uh, perhaps a two or three percentage point lead in Florida, which looked like they were also wrong. I don't think that indicates weakness with the Biden campaign. I think it, indi I think it means we're going to be uh, looking at the reliability of some of these polls yet again. But again, these are not final results yet. We'll see what happens. I want to turn now to the topic of coronavirus with you, Dr. Kavita Patel, uh, again, Yahoo News medical contributor. Dr. Patel, it's repeatedly been said that tonight coronavirus is on the ballot. I'm wondering if you're reading it the same way and if you think that this pandemic has actually been one of the reasons so many voters have been motivated to get to the polls. Yeah, I do think it's been one of the main reasons, but I'll be honest with you, it's been pretty interesting to watch kind of how the votes have broken down, at least so far, because if you look at the states that were called incredibly early for D President Trump, like the Dakotas, for example, which we knew were always going to be pretty supportive of the president, those are some of the states that have been the hardest hit. You've had 50% positivity rates in South Dakota, for example. And we know from data to date that about half of the country is not wearing masks or don't believe in wearing masks. And so this is kind of reflective of what we're seeing. So yes, coronavirus is causing people to turn out, but not maybe in the way people think, even though a majority of the country has expressed frustration and discontent with how the United States has handled coronavirus. You're seeing uh, that people, I think, are still actually putting the issue of coronavirus squarely with the issue of economic outlook and some of the other things that I think are putting people to either vote for President Trump or for Vice President Biden. And I think it's also coming down into the Senate races, which are 
I, I'll be honest, you know, a lot of people are wondering how close this would be. Would coronavirus lead to, as Rick mentioned, kind of an early evening? And I think we're all kind of seeing the numbers that this is not going to be an early evening, even though coronavirus is on the ballot. It's just a lot closer than we realize. Dr. Rick, Mattel, I know you um, have a question. I just wanted to yeah, quickly say here. we do have we do have a lot of movement now outside of the White House. It has been largely a peaceful night so far, but everyone can see at home. We see some protests, it seems, in D.C. right now outside of the White House. Just wanted to call everyone's attention to Black Lives Matter Plaza in D.C. Rick, I know you had a question for Dr. Patel. Yeah, a lot of people feel like if Joe Biden were to win and uh, if we were to get a uh, Senate that was like Democrats, and somehow that would mean that we would we would suddenly have a more effective federal response to dealing with the coronavirus. And Joe Biden has outlined how he would differ with President Trump on this. But how much difference would that actually make? I mean, it's not like the coronavirus is paying attention to the election returns. It's winter. We've obviously got people crowding inside. Got a lot of people who don't want to wear masks or comply with other uh, guidelines like that. So how much difference would it make if Biden became president? Look, I, I think the key difference will be actually having kind of structural federal response. And, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. You'll have leadership in place. Already you've seen kind of this divisiveness where the president has contradicted his leaders at the CDC, at the FDA, even his own close advisors, Dr. Birx, Dr. Fauci. So I think it would come from a very different kind of tone with leaders that have the confidence and the faith of the president and vice versa, that they know that the president will also listen to their to their advice. I think, number two, you would see a much different kind of federal response in terms of data infrastructure. Let me just give you a case in point. To this day, we still can't provide regional and area hospitals with a sense of predicting what the trends might look like in December. We all know locally because we're practicing on the ground, but we have enough data that we should be able to tell people down to a zip code, look, this has been your positivity rate. We think this could affect your system the following way. And then third, it's something that we haven't talked a lot about in recent days, but it's still an issue. We still have supply issues. They're not as bad as they were in March. We're not talking about shortages of masks and people reusing them for weeks on end. But we're already seeing area hospitals telling their emergency room doctors and nurses, you can only get one mask this month and you have to make sure that you don't waste it. So I think those are all good examples. And fast forward a couple more months, we'll have a vaccine maybe several that will be approved by the FDA. And that strategy for a rollout and getting, you know, hundreds of millions of Americans vaccinated, not once, but probably twice, it looks like it will need a two-dose vaccine. That will require a very strong federal response. So I do believe that a change in administration could result in a tangible way. And to your point, it won't get rid of the coronavirus, but it'll give us a much better chance at decreasing the death toll and the incidence of coronavirus to date. I want to call up again some of those images that we had seen just a moment ago in D.C. Black Lives Matter Plaza there, as you can see, a lot of folks gathering just outside the White House. Now, today has been relatively peaceful so far. However, a lot of folks have been very anxious and very concerned about election unrest, particularly this evening that might be unfolding. Now, Washington, D.C., we had seen businesses start to lock their doors, board their windows in anticipation that there would be riots and protests, perhaps even some vandalizing of stores, some looting. We are seeing, however, again, we are seeing a large crowd gathering here. It does not, however, look at all violent um, from what we're seeing from these images. But this is, of course, something that we will be watching throughout the night. I uh, want to do one last look here right now to the Yahoo Election Center. We do have Joe Biden actually picking up some extra seats right now. It was 122 at the start of the show. Right now, Joe Biden has 131 electoral college votes. Remember, it is a race to 270. Right now, Donald Trump is holding firm at 92 electoral college votes. Uh, during the show, of course, we did add Colorado as a state that had been called 
for former Vice President Joe Biden. Well, the election coverage will be continuing this night at midnight, of course, uh, with Melody Hom. But that is all for us right now. I want to thank my panelists this evening, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman, Yahoo News, Hunter Walker, and of course, our medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Thank you all so much for joining us.
ciudadana americana.
I don't. Yeah. Are required? Yeah. Um, by, by who? If you don't want to wear one, we will register you outside. Yeah, it's a little longer of a process. Okay, and so you need to check in um, this um, on the left. Go ahead. There. And uh, Mary can help you in the middle. When the second slide pops up, they're all recorded, and you can get their uh, folder in the right hand, the living cycle, and take a little sticker, because you have an eight. Just so high. I thought I was really now. <laughs> have a nice evening. Thank you.
want to let you know I'm running low on my battery. I'm trying to get Jeffrey to Hillary's live view.
family in this room. Okie dokie. So I'm just gonna print out the ballot.
I'm chair. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You can I can see you, but you can't see me. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know that transportation is always challenging in this time of coronavirus, but thank you for joining us virtually here this evening, so that I can praise you uh, for retaining our House Democratic majority. Under your leadership, Madam Chair, we have held the House. And now, when the, after all the votes are counted, we'll see uh, how much better we will do than that. Uh, we are in a situation where some of the states have just said we're not counting anymore until tomorrow morning. And of course, the West Coast has not chimed in yet. Uh, so there's more to come. Uh, our race this time was all about health care. This was vote your health. Uh, we had that in the last election. Our, our, our for the people agenda was we're going to lower health care costs by lowering the cost of prescription drugs 
preserving pre-existing conditions. It became the issue of the 2018 election under the leadership of the, of the um, policy committee that Congress, uh, that Madam Chair was the, uh, a, a co-chair of then, carrying that message into this election because it is of concern to the American people, it is amplified uh, by the coronavirus. Uh, so our purpose in this race was to win so that we could protect the Affordable Care Act and that we could crush the virus, uh, that we could uh, stop the spread of it, that we could reward our, our workers who risk their lives to save lives and now might be losing their jobs, and that we can put money in the pockets of the American people. So I'm very, very proud of the fact uh, that tonight, uh, relatively early, we are able to say uh, that we have held the House. It is uh, uh, something quite spectacular because the people who helped us win were the people who have been affected by it. Thousands of those who have been diagnosed or members of their family diagnosed with a pre-existing condition have spoken out, have told their stories. And that was the most compelling argument of all. Uh, so again, uh, that was our purpose. Uh, we have succeeded in that. Uh, now we have to win the White House, and we're well on our way to doing that. Uh, but again, oh, we just were speaking to our friends in Virginia. Uh, over 2 million votes have not been counted in Virginia yet. So we're waiting to see what that brings in and what that means uh, for the presidential race. But I'm here just to sing the praises of our House Democrats and our candidates, uh, not just in terms of numbers. It's not just about the quantity. It's about the quality of leadership that they provide for our country. It's about the fact that they are there in the Congress. We are all there for the people. And to have a strategic plan uh, to be successful, uh, to uh, retain our control, to hold the House, actually, is how we say it, uh, we couldn't be better served uh, than by our chair, uh, Sherry Bustos. Uh, and all of the uh, pillars of winning an election, whether it's the mobilization, the grassroots level, even virtually, she has succeeded. Whether it's about messaging in a very disciplined way, she has succeeded. And about amassing the financial resources, the money, the third M, uh, she has broken all records. And, uh, I, and, and through it all, she retained and commanded the respect of the House members and the confidence of all of our candidates. So with that, I want to acknowledge, again, uh, Chair Sherry Bustos of Illinois. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield to you and with an honor. Thank you. All right, Speaker Pelosi, thank you so much for your kind words and um, obviously your leadership of this caucus. Uh, you've been absolutely amazing. Um, I'm joining you tonight from Moline, Illinois, which is my hometown. Uh, Moline is kind of the center of America. It's, uh, you know, people here, they, they take that literally and they work hard and look after each other. It's around places like this that uh, if your neighbor falls ill, you offer to bring over a meal to them or you offer to look after their kids. It was in 2018 that Democrats won back the House by reaching out to people in towns like Moline, by listening to them. And here's what people in those towns, the center of America,
by building the infrastructure of America in a green and resilient way, creating jobs and opportunity not only for jobs but for equity, for ownership of companies that participate in all of that with a workforce development uh, educationally to train a young people on how to uh, not only aspire to that profession but perhaps to some ownership. And for the people, we will, we will uh, talk about uh, cleaner government with H.R. 1, which we will pass on the floor of the House on the very first day of the new Congress. Madam Chair re re referenced the Elijah Cummings uh, HR3, our bill to lower the cost of prescription drugs and also to en by enabling us to negotiate uh, with, uh, for the uh, Secretary of HHS to negotiate for lower prices. I want to reference in HR1 our John Lewis ending voter suppression uh, uh, legislation that is so important and as you've seen so needed. Uh, in this campaign. So, uh, Madam Chair, as you had suggested, it's not over until every vote is counted, and there are plenty more votes to count. In fact, we haven't even started in my state of California, the whole West Coast and beyond. And uh, again, we, uh, we look forward to uh, coming together in our Democratic majority in the Congress of the United States. That success would not be possible without your leadership. Thank you, Madam Chair, Sherry Bustos. Thank you all. Good evening. Well, if you're here to stand to speak with Vice President Biden this evening, or anyone on his campaign,
örülnek el ezt össze.
excuse me, 17th Street, period, not 14th.
Good evening and welcome to Yahoo's 2020 election coverage. I'm Melody Hom. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is midnight on the East Coast, 9 p.m. Pacific time here in Los Angeles, and you are looking at live pictures of the White House and Vice President Joe Biden's campaign headquarters in Wilmington, Delaware. Patience is a key word in this nail-biter of a presidential race between Trump and Biden. And one thing is for sure, we're looking at some pretty razor-thin margins here. Neither campaign expects a clear winner tonight that's according to reporting from NBC. But here's a quick, quick recap of what we know so far tonight. As of this current moment, we're looking at Biden with 209 electoral votes and Trump with 118 electoral votes, as you can see here on our 2020 Election Center site. There are no surprises with some of the results so far. Joe Biden logged multiple victories in some of those blue-leaning states, including New York, Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, to name a few and with President Trump winning several states, including Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, and Kentucky. This election, of course, is happening in a historic moment by many measures, colored by a global pandemic, which has triggered a healthcare and economic crisis. It's a record-breaking election in terms of voter turnout. Most Americans are expected to have cast their ballots way before election day, and Americans who voted prior to today, 73% of the total votes casted in 2016, that means at least 101.9 million people actually voted early nationwide. I want to introduce our all-star panel today uh, to break down today's results. Yahoo News West Coast correspondent Andrew Romano, Yahoo News national reporter Marquise Francis, and Yahoo Finance economics correspondent Brian Chung. So happy to be joined in your company today. I want to get straight to you, Andrew. Uh, give us a sense of what you're hearing from all of your sources around the country uh, just on how tight this race really is. As I understand it, a lot of the Republicans were initially very afraid uh, that it would be a landslide victory for Vice President Biden, clearly looking like it's not the case. Yeah, I think we can put the possibility of a landslide for Biden out of the question. The polls suggested it was possible. Um, in a bunch of the early states to report, the polls show that Biden was essentially tied with Trump. Uh, it does not seem to be going Biden's way. Florida was one that was put out of reach fairly early on for Biden. Uh, North Carolina, Georgia, still counting the votes, still figuring it out, but Trump is slightly ahead. It may be that uh, we get through all of those states, uh, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Ohio, uh, and Biden doesn't pick up any of them. That said, the action is all going to shift to the upper Midwest Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, across the Rust Belt, those states that are uh, counting their early votes a little bit more slowly. Um, and those are going to be the states that really decided it. it's almost a, a redux of uh, 2016. One thing I want to note that has some Democrats worried, Ohio, a state where the polls showed that uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump were essentially tied going into the race, uh, it, it looks like Trump is going to pull that out by eight percentage points. That's the same margin he beat Hillary Clinton by there in 2016. He's beating his polls by about seven points, and that has Democrats worried about how much Trump might beat his polls by in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, states that are demographically similar to Ohio. So that's what we're going to be watching as this unfolds over the rest of the night and probably over the rest of the week. Yeah, election week, as we're now referring to it, right? Andrew, a quick follow on Ohio. Um, you know, that classic cliche, as Ohio goes, so does the nation. As I understand it, no Republican has ever won the White House without winning Ohio. Um, and I know a lot of folks there see it as a point of pride, right, that they have a pulse of the nation. Um, how do you anticipate if Ohio does go the way of Trump? Uh, is that clearly a signal um, that, the, that the, the rest of the country and the rest of the results will sort of reflect that reality? No, I, I don't think it necessarily will. Um, but I do think that Trump is beating expectations in Ohio. And those expectations were set by the polling. Um, he was ahead by about one percentage point, half of a percentage point in the polls. It looks like he's headed for a seven or eight percentage point victory. That is a big gap. Um, and just because of the demographic similarities and the similarities to the situation in 2016, where the polls underestimated Trump in the upper Midwest, it, it, it is worrisome for Democrats in Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, those states that that Biden needs to win, that he needs to flip in order to, to get to 270. One thing I will note is that Biden is looking fairly strong in Arizona. The state hasn't been called yet by the AP, uh, but he's ahead in uh, the essential uh, uh, urban uh, and suburban area of Maricopa County around Phoenix. 
Uh, if he wins Arizona, there is a path to 270 for Biden that doesn't involve Pennsylvania. He would need to win Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and the single uh, electoral vote from the second congressional district in Nebraska. That would get him to exactly 270. Um, and just the fact that we're talking about that on a night when people thought uh, Biden could win 350 electoral votes or more just shows uh, how expectations have been recalibrated. Yeah, sobering reality here. Brian, I want to get to you. Um, of course, Andrew, mentioning Pennsylvania, a really hot spot for both of these candidates, as I understand it. Uh, former Vice President Biden actually visited Pennsylvania 14 times uh, over the course of his him being nominated as the Democratic nominee. Uh, when you think about Pennsylvania, you know, that's his hometown. Uh, do you anticipate that that will sort of be in the favor of Biden? Um, how are you thinking through perhaps Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, as we do not anticipate results to actually become clear tonight? Well, absolutely, Melody. And it's no secret that Joe Biden has been very fixated on Pennsylvania, including in the final minutes uh, before polls closing. I believe Joe Biden did make uh, a stop to his former uh, hometown residence in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's been spending a lot of time in Philadelphia in recent uh, days. But one thing to know about Pennsylvania is that it could indeed be the case that we won't get a true final result or a good solid read, at least, on who is going to win Pennsylvania until tomorrow. There's been some reporting uh, from some other outlets that have said that uh, they might not be reporting any more mail ballots, at least in the Philadelphia area. That could be hundreds of thousands of ballots that have been received that may not be counted until tomorrow morning or even as late as Friday. So that could be something that could trip up uh, what is going to be a really critical state, as you outlined there. Uh, no key Senate race is going on in that state. So again, it is going to be primarily that presidential race that's going to be in view. But again, right now, it seems like with the results coming in, it's a bit too early to say who is going to win that state, but it is so critical, especially if it is indeed the case that Ohio goes to President Trump, uh, whether or not Pennsylvania goes to Biden really could be the deciding factor when they do ultimately tally up who gets the 271st. And Marquise, thinking about the demographic picture here, we know there has been a lot of clamoring over that so-called suburban white woman vote, right? But when you think about the Latinx community, um, specifically looking at Florida, right, with Miami-Dade, or uh, parts of Texas, or of course here in California, which does tend to go blue, how are you getting a pulse of um, how different demos, how different ethnicities are really feeling about this election as you have spoken to many of these folks, whether they're black and brown communities ahead of today? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the numbers that we're seeing tonight are just showing the enthusiasm with so many groups of people for President Trump. You know, prior to COVID-19, I attended five President Trump rallies, two of those being in Texas and another one in Orlando, Florida, where he kicked off his 2020 reelection campaign. And I can't tell you the amount of shirts and signs that I saw Latinos for Trump or blacks for Trump. And I think oftentimes when it comes to polling or you're hearing anecdotes from, you know, a majority of the black community, the Latinx community, you're hearing, you know, overwhelmingly Democratic. But oftentimes I think there's a lot of voters that are just often ignored. Um, recently, I did a, a piece about, you know, black men and, and a lot of their affinity for Trump. And a lot of it uh, stems from a lot of in individualistic, um, you know, priorities, whether that be financial or just wanting to be you know, free-spirited or just not have government involved with so much. But I think oftentimes when you talk to people, there is an enthusiasm. I've been watching so much cable news, similar to kind of what Brian uh, said tonight. I probably watch more cable news tonight than all of this year. But you're just seeing the continued enthusiasm around the country, even on Yahoo.com. Um, earlier, they showed uh, the Latinos for Trump, the Cubans down in, in Miami, and they're just shaking their flags. They're singing their, their favorite songs, but they're you know, just raising flags of Latinos for Trump. And I think it's just indicative with the enthusiasm around the country. And I think the real question that, you know, as we continue, you know, going into 2020 and even future elections are, you know, what are we missing? And you mentioned the white suburban women, uh, and, you know, their feelings on different things. I heard in cable news earlier, the suburbs really uh, determine uh, what happens when it comes to these elections? Obviously, we think about a lot of these big cities, you know, New York City, Houston, Miami. Um, obviously, these are very democratic cities, but when you go outside of them, you're looking at what really determines the race. Outside of Houston is very Republican. Outside of Miami is very red. Outside of even, you know, New York City, 
very red. This morning I voted in my town of Oakland, New Jersey, and I actually ran there because my mom was at work. I had no car. And I was just stunned by the amount of Trump flags I saw on my run. Um, these people that I grew up, I went to school with. And, um, you know, it just shows their enthusiasm even around a big metropolitan city. And I think we're just going to continue to see that and t- unless Democrats can figure out a way to actually tap into these suburban voters and uh, marginalized communities who have had an affinity for Trump and figure out how to bring them bring them along. And you're living, looking at a live shot here of Trump supporters in Miami, Marquise, as you were just mentioning. Uh, it is in Little Havana, Florida, where there's a huge Cuban population, as you alluded to. Of course, we want to take a look at the market action that we're seeing today. It is after hours, of course. Uh, but what are we expecting for the trading day as we uh, anticipate another day on Wall Street? Dow, S&P, Nasdaq futures all kind of surging higher um, throughout the course of this evening. Brian Chung, I'm going to get straight to you. Are you surprised by this movement we're seeing right now? Um, Many of the strategists and economists we talked to at Yahoo Finance sort of have baked in a a potential contested election, right? Uh, What do you think is causing this exuberance uh, as we as we look to the markets here? Well, Melody, everyone who's been watching this election is already feeling a lot of anxiety and watching the market has not provided any more relief. In fact, it could be even more nauseating to have watched the market action over the previous hours. As you mentioned, we're in after hours trading, not necessarily as liquid markets as we usually see during the market day. S&P futures appear to be up uh, pretty substantially, about 1.15 percent. Dow futures up just a little bit, about 122 as of right now. But what's been interesting Thing is that it's really been teetering across the day, uh, actually between the periods of 7.45 and 9.50 p.m. Eastern time. They were in the negative and then rocketed higher. In fact, the gains on the Dow were substantially higher about an hour ago. They've since come down a little bit, although they are still holding on to their gains. But what's been even more interesting has really been movement in the currencies markets as well. When you take a look at the U.S. dollar strengthening broadly across a basket of other currencies. You can check out how uh, the euro, in addition to the British pound, have gotten weaker against the U.S. dollar. But when you look at specifically the Chinese yuan, the USD to CNH, that is offshore yuan, the yuan has really uh, gotten quite weak against the U.S. dollar. You could argue to what degree is that pricing in maybe the optimism over a Trump win there. That could explain some of the yuan weakness. Um, You also see some of the dollar strengthening in other types of currencies, specifically the Mexican peso another one worth watching there. And then moving over to bond yields, a very interesting dynamic in play there as well. When you look at the 10-year and the 30-year losing a little bit of steam, that does show that there could be some uh, inflows into those uh, bonds as uh, people try to look for safe assets. But again, quite noisy, especially as the uh, stock markets continue to rock back and forth. Again, whether or not you can glean anything from these uh, futures and markets, whether or not they're pricing in a Trump or a Biden victory is a bit too noisy right now to discern. Maybe we'll get a little bit more certainty, but there's no doubt, Melody, that the volatility, at least for the past few hours, has been quite elevated. And an update here, uh, former Vice President Biden did win Hawaii's four electoral votes. Hawaii did close polling at midnight, so that was a quick turnaround there, uh, a very quick and easy one, which is not necessarily the pulse of the rest of the nation. Uh, I do want to touch on the other races, of course, the down ballot races that are perhaps equally important as we think about the balance of power in this nation. Of course, the Senate has been led by Republicans for the last six years. The Democrats are hoping for some sort of blue tsunami to a certain extent. We did see that Colorado did flip a seat. Uh, However, there are many of these elections still in play. We do anticipate a couple runoff elections in January, specifically looking at states like Georgia. Andrew, I want to get to you. What are some of the races that you're looking at most closely right now? Are they more contested or more kind of nail biting uh, than you anticipated? Or is it sort of playing out as you anticipated? Yeah, it's a bit early to say right now. What we know is that Democrats have picked up a Senate seat in Colorado. Uh, John Hickenlooper defeated incumbent Republican Senator Cory Gardner. We also know that incumbent Democratic Senator in Alabama, Doug Jones, lost to Tommy Tuberville, a Republican. Um, That is a one for one exchange there. So it doesn't change the balance of power. And what we're going to be watching uh, as the hours unfold tonight and perhaps into the wee early morning hours and even the coming days uh, are the results out of states like North Carolina, Iowa, 
um, Maine, uh, where uh, Democrats, where Republicans are defending seats, uh, where Democrats are still in the hunt to flip those seats. Um, we're also watching Arizona. That race is uh, Martha McSally, Republican incumbent. Mark Kelly is looking strong in that race. That might be another Democratic flip. But just to remind uh, viewers, uh, in order for Democrats to get control of the Senate, if Joe Biden wins the presidency, they need to flip three seats. They need to net three seats. Um, so they would actually need to flip four additional ones, given that loss in Alabama. Uh, conversely, in order to gain control of the Senate, uh, they would need to net four seats if um, uh, Donald Trump remains president. So it is uh, unclear right now what the balance of power is going to be. And we're just going to have to watch all of these close races as they unfold. I do want to mention that we expect Biden to be speaking at 12.30 a.m. Eastern. That's just in a few minutes here. Um, he did kind of allude to that earlier today, that regardless of the outcome, regardless of the current state of affairs, he did plan to speak. You're taking, you're getting a look at Wilmington, Delaware, which is where his campaign headquarters are. Marquise, I want to get to you. You know, Andrew was talking about some of these kind of contested races that seem to be very close. Um, I want to kind of double down on this idea of the runoff election that we will be seeing in January. When you look at Georgia, for example, uh, John Ossoff and David Perdue, uh, looking at that election right now. Um, and then, of course, thinking about Kelly Loeffler, who uh, did take that vacant seat. How do you anticipate those two races playing out come January? Yeah, well, it's honestly, obviously, the voters will determine it. But I think, obviously, there's always going to be initial enthusiasm around the Democratic candidates. Uh, Raphael Warnock, who is a preacher down there, in uh, near the Atlanta, Georgia, where actually MLK uh, once was a preacher at the church. But we've seen in the past where, you know, when running for governor, Stacey Abrams seems to have an overwhelming lead. Um, and Brian Kemp uh, overtook her by 0.4 percent of the margin. But there seems to be this enthusiasm initially when it comes to Democrats. But you never know when it comes to this runoff. Um, I, I do think uh, the, the Warnock camp, as well as the Ossoff camp, feel as though they have a, a great uh, opportunity in the runoff. I think they feel good one-on-one. -on -one. I know Senator Loeffler uh, got caught up when it came to Black Lives Matter. She's also a um, one of the owners of the Atlanta uh, WNBA team, and she was vehemently against the kneeling and a lot of things that came out there. And also has been a, a rising star within the Democratic Party. So I think those are two names that have been out there previously, and I think uh, they have great re name recognition. So when it comes to the runoff, I think um, both camps feel very strong about their uh, possibility of winning. And a quick look at our 2020 election center right now. It looks like Biden did clinch Minnesota's 10 electoral votes, now placing him with 223 total. Donald Trump with 118 so far. Andrew, I want to ask you the final question of the evening. Of course, when you look back at 2016 and how Hillary Clinton did manage to get about 3 million more popular votes, um, but ultimately Donald Trump did end up winning all the electoral votes uh, he needed to win the presidency, looking back to even 2000, right, with Al Gore and George W. Bush. Do you anticipate that sort of outcome, um, perhaps, uh, whether it's Donald Trump contesting it, whether it's another Supreme Court case? How do you anticipate this kind of a frenzy? Uh, as we know, these are unprecedented times. Yeah, we're, we're almost certainly going to see a popular vote victory for Joe Biden, um, following in the wake of his predecessors, Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. Um, the question will be whether he, he follows them in losing the Electoral College. We thought that maybe wouldn't be as close to call as we're seeing now tonight, but in to be close. And the closer it is in these states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, where it looks like this, this race will be decided, the more that we can anticipate uh, lawsuits, litigation, uh, challenges to individual ballots, um, we'll see. We'll see. We're still waiting on the results to come in, and maybe the margins are uh, too are, are are wider um, than they would be to spark that kind of thing. But I am, I'm not optimistic that we're going to get out of this without um, some significant uh, contention uh, to this election, and it, it's going to go on whether it's for days, uh, a week, or longer. We'll see. Um, but it's 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 not going to be wrapped up tonight, and it's not going to be probably wrapped up tomorrow. Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to final. jump in there. 
I'm sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to jump in there. I think I, I think I'd be remiss to to not say uh, Andrew mentioned. Um, it looks like Joe Biden, you know, will likely win the popular vote, but we're not sure if he's going to win those electoral electoral, electoral college votes. Um, and it just begs the question, you know, is the electoral college still something uh, that that's that this country needs? Right. We're, we're obviously using it for this 2020 election, but we're on Chile and they, they've kind of the people have risen up and they've actually they're now rewriting the Constitution. And it's a question uh, for the American people moving forward. Um, is that the way, you know, a way, a, path, a possible path forward? Um, if the majority of people in 2016 said they did not want Donald Trump, but obviously he was the president, I think moving forward, that should be definitely a question. And I've been talking to a lot of people over the past few weeks, and um, it's getting to the point that we're seeing, obviously, some unrest in the cities like D.C., and people are just frustrated, right? Uh, if you can't, if you vote and you feel as though the majority of people have voted one way and nothing happens in their favor. What else do you have? So I think you're going to continue to see unrest. You're going to continue to see people just upset. And I've been hearing a lot about evolution versus uh, revolution. And a lot of people are ready to uh, see significant change. And I think one way is redoing uh, how the Electoral College looks. And to that point, Marquise, we have seen some protests happening at the Black Lives Matter Plaza in D.C., as well as across Portland and Seattle. Andrew, I do want to ask, you know, picking up on what Marquis said, how long do you anticipate uh, the, the tallying of results to actually take? Because we know state officials across Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin have all kind of suggested that it will take at least until Friday. Um, what are you hearing from your sources on the ground? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that uh, timeline is accurate. We're expecting to get some results tomorrow morning, potentially, out of Wisconsin. Officials in Michigan and Pennsylvania have said not to expect final results uh, until maybe the end of this week, as you said, Friday. Um, we'll see if that pans out. We'll see if there is a margin that makes it clear before those final results come in that one candidate or the other has won. I wouldn't bet on that. That it is looking like those states are going to be close. I will say uh, that uh, before we decide who's won or hasn't won this election, that it's very much still up in the air. If Joe Biden flips Michigan, Wisconsin, and Arizona, uh, he could very well get to 270. Um, he doesn't need Pennsylvania to do that, um, but we're going to be watching Pennsylvania closely as well, and it's going to come down to the wire. You know, we started talking about Ohio. We have to end the show talking about Ohio. Ohio did go to Trump. Uh, now Donald Trump has 145 electoral votes. As we all have suggested, the, the night is long, the week is long. So everyone get your rest, grab your coffee. It's going to be a long road ahead. And I just want to remind everyone that Vice President Biden will be expected to speak at 12.30 a.m. Eastern. That's in about seven minutes. And of course, we have coverage all night long, all week long. Uh, on Yahoo, Yahoo Finance, and HuffPost. Make sure to stay tuned. Good night.
here. Whatever it is, we've got to make things better so that they don't look like they did back in June. Right? I don't blame whatever it is you report on next. We'll be here watching. Thank you very much for uh, that full briefing from Atlanta. So, Steve Kornacki, you heard it uh, from Blaine. Uh, if this were a sitcom, I would have interrupted and said, I'm sorry, I thought for a second there you said the counting will take two days. No, she said the counting may take two days, and we're hearing that from more than one state. Yeah, and again, you could just see here it, it, the, what the what Biden and the Democrats are trying to make up here. I was just noticing the, the difference here. Trump's lead is still, it's basically sitting at 300,000. It's come down. Um, yeah, we're so focused on the Atlanta metro area. We should be, I should notice, I should note Macon, the, the city of Macon here, Bibb County, actually just reported its early absentee vote, and Joe Biden got a big batch of them there, so that did bring him back uh, close, a little bit closer. But obviously, it is all in this Atlanta metro area you're talking about Fulton County let's give you a sense here 230,000 votes are so estimated you know left to be coming in here and again you see the margin Biden's running at even with the same day vote that seems to be doing extremely well and then how about this one in next door to Cab County yeah, 277,000 votes to come in again this might even be a stronger area for Joe Biden so yeah there are still it's a half a million votes between those two places you know when you're looking at for Arizona, Minnesota, uh, Nevada, Iowa. Like, it doesn't seem like there's any reason to expect that those will be super long horizons. But we are getting explicit, not just warnings, but almost promises that it's going to be multiple days before we get results in Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, you just heard the report on Georgia. Yeah. So, you know, there's also, I would just say, I don't want to forget about this, but let me call it back up here. North Carolina remains uncalled. The margin is 76,000 vote for Donald Trump. Remember, the ballots that are in the mail right now that were postmarked, they will still be counted. We don't know how many there are. So that's another variable we're trying to figure out. How many more ballots are going to come in in North Carolina? Could that still plausibly affect the outcome in North Carolina at about 75,000 vote margin? Um, in Wisconsin, we do that. We are hearing, I'll show you, Milwaukee County here, and I think you were talking about this earlier, you know, core Democratic area. You see a lot of vote left to come. This happened in the 2018 midterm election. I think it was sometime around this point in the night in the 2018 midterm election. We suddenly got from the city of Milwaukee. We got their absentee vote all recorded at once. They completely changed the race. The Democrat won the governor's race, and those votes were recorded. I think sometime about leaving here in about four in the morning or so. Oh, 
Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, you got a few, Waukesha County. I think there's 38 or there's 39 of these. These are municipalities, generally larger places that do that sort of separate from the county. And those can come in later in a lot of cases. And I think Milwaukee's going to be one of them. Steve Karnacki, thank you very much. Let's go to our friend Claire McCaskill, forming the Sumner from the great state of Missouri, uh, who started off this night quite confident and who has retained the same smile and look of confidence, and of course, over the course of the night, as lots of other people who are in the Democrats are working Everybody chill, put, you know, put away the sharp instruments, we're going to be fine. <laughs> um, I, I am a little, I am more worried about the Senate, although interestingly in Montana, I just took a look, and Steve Bullock is, uh, has the same number of votes as, as Donald Trump in Montana, with half the vote counted. Um, you know, 6,000 more votes than Joe Biden. Now you say, well, 6,000, that's not that much, but this is Montana. Uh, 6,000 is a lot. So the fact that he is running ahead of Joe Biden by that much may break uh, the streak we've seen where the Senate races all fall in line with um, how people are voting at the top of the ticket. Claire, um First of all, I'm still recovering from my blow against North Carolina, and, and, I, and I hope that North Carolina is being the story of the night. I, I love North Carolina. I really didn't mean to run afoul of um, anybody in North Carolina. But the, the fact is that the Biden campaign is in the exact same sort of place and mood that they were in over the weekend, where their number one path to 270 is to re or to resurrect the blue wall. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. That plan is not thwarted, not delivered any setback other than needing a little more time. After that, it gets a little more murky. Can you talk about um, what, and we should say, that would be all they need, especially if Arizona continues to look the way it looks right now. But can you, can you
Please welcome Vice President Joe Biden and Dr. Jill Biden. is commendable. We knew this was going to go wrong, but who knew we're going to go into maybe tomorrow morning, maybe even longer. But look, we feel good about where we are. We really do. I'm here to tell you tonight, we believe we're on track to win this election. We knew because of the unprecedented early vote and the mail-in vote that it's going to take a while. We're going to have to be patient until we, uh, the hard work of tallying the votes is finished. And it ain't over until every vote is counted, every ballot is counted. But we're feeling good. We're feeling good about where we are. 
We believe one of the nets has suggested we've already won Arizona, but we're confident about Arizona. That's a turnaround. We also just called it for Minnesota, and we're still in the game in Georgia, although that's not one we expected. And we're feeling real good about Wisconsin and Michigan. And by the way, it's going to take time to count the votes. We're going to win Pennsylvania. Yeah. I'm going to talk to the folks in Philly, Allegheny County, Scranton, and they're really encouraged by the turnout and what they see. Look, you know, we could know the results as early as tomorrow morning, but it may take a little longer. As I've said all along, it's not my place or Donald Trump's place to declare who's won this election. That's the decision of the American people. But I'm optimistic about this outcome. And I want to thank every one of you who came out and voted in this election. And by the way, Chris Coons and the Democrats, congratulations here in Delaware. John Carney. Hey, John, the Gov, yeah, I, I, the whole team, man. You've done a great job. I'm grateful to the poll workers, to our volunteers, our canvassers, everyone who participated in this democratic process. And I'm grateful to all of my supporters here in Delaware and all across the nation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And folks, you heard me say it before. Every time I walk out of my grandpa's house up in Scranton, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandma, when she was alive, yelled, no, Joey, spread it. Keep the faith, guys. We're going to win this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your patience is great. Let's walk over here.
Well, here, here we're trying to figure out what's left out there and what is it, what's the predominant color. It's what we've got 10 guys sitting there and 10 guys and gals sitting there in Nerdville. Uh, the, 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 can I go doing right now that we're just talking about they're, they're, they're still away yeah no, no. Uh, but but look I, my gut tells me that this is why this thing is going to have another couple of twists and turns
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. to disenfranchise that group of people, and we won't stand for it. so good, uh, such a vote, such a success. The citizens of this country have come out in record numbers. This is a record. There's never been anything like it. To support our incredible movement, we won states that we weren't expected to win. Florida, we didn't win it. We won it by a lot. Since I saw that originally, it's been changed, and the numbers have substantially come down just in a small amount of votes. So we want that, obviously, to stay in play. But most importantly, we're winning Pennsylvania by a tremendous to 
good Pennsylvania areas where they happen to like your president. We are winning Michigan. I'll tell you, I looked at the numbers. I said, I looked, I said, wow, that's a lot. By almost 300,000 votes. And 65% of the voters. And we're winning Wisconsin. And I said, we're winning. We don't need all of them. We need, because when you add Texas in, which wasn't added, I spoke with the really wonderful governor of Texas just a little while ago, and Greg Abbott, he said, uh, congratulations. He called me to congratulate me on winning Texas. And he, we won Texas. I don't think they finished quite the tabulation, but there's no way. And uh, it was almost complete, but he congratulated me. And he said, by the way, what's going on? I've never seen anything like this. Can I tell you what? Nobody has. So we won by 107,000 votes with 81% of the vote. That's Michigan. So when you take those three states in particular, and you take all of the others, I mean, we have, we have so many. We had such a big night. You just take a look at all of these states that we've won tonight. And then you take a look at the kind of margins that we've won about. And, and all of a sudden, it's not like we're up 12 votes and we have 60% left. We won states, and all of a sudden, I said, what happened to the election? It's off. And we have all these announcers saying, what happened? And then they said, oh, because you know what happened? They knew they couldn't win. So they said, let's go to court. And did I predict this, Newton? Did I say this? I've been saying this from the day I heard they were going to send out tens of millions of ballots. I said exactly. Because either they were going to win, or if they didn't win, they'll take us to court. So Florida was a tremendous victory. 307. Ohio, a tremendous state, a big state. I love Ohio. We won by 8.1%. Almost 500,000 votes. North Carolina, big victory with North Carolina. Yeah. And so we won there. We lead by 76,000 votes with almost 500,000. Can I have some of the votes? This is a fraud. And this is an embarrassment yeah. to our country. Yeah. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list. It's, it's, a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won. So worked with us, and uh, Mr. Vice President, say a few words, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to join you in, in thanking more than 60 million Americans who have already cast their vote for four more years for President Donald Trump. And while votes continue to be counted, uh, we're going to remain vigilant, as the President said. Uh, the right to vote has been at the center of our democracy since the founding of this nation, and we're going to protect the integrity of the vote. But I really believe, with all of my heart, with the extraordinary margins, Mr. President, that you've inspired in the states that you just described. Yeah. 
uh, and the way that you launched this movement across the country to make America great again, uh, I truly do believe, as you do, that we are on the road to victory and we will make America great again.